market effects. This paper, probably I think it's the only one that has a, the preliminary sign on it. Still is, so in a way, really use, trying to use this to get ideas of, uh, of where to move uh, with this. And the key result is quite nice. Frame it. So what's, what's the, the setting here? So we have the EU, the US, and Canada importing clothing and textile items uh, from different countries from the rest of the world, as well as from China. And until 2005, there were big restrictions uh, on, on, on those on importation clothes. Have these here, but basically, as you, most of you know, these were uh, import import goods. The D on China is bigger because, as has become clear, you know, after several papers uh, made made that point quite quite transparent, the restrictions on China were way larger than the restrictions on uh, imports coming from the rest of the world. So, well, let's just call that instead of saying. In the United States, Canada, it's EUS, short. I'm happy with Canada. It's like a right. subscript. The right thing. <laughs> US, I guess. So, yeah, so basically, at some point, basically one day, first day of 2005, this system of quotas uh, was eliminated. Now, our question is, what happens with these flows? So several people have already looked at uh, actually both of these arrows. The general you know, view is that not much happened here in the sense that even though quotas were lifted on some of those uh, on imports coming from some of those countries, some of them actually lost, you know, exported less after the, after the policy shock uh, than before, simply because they were crowded out by coming from China. But no one has looked at this other arrow here. And actually, this is something very unusual. Uh, I mean, uh, there are very few papers trying to look at these third country effects empirically, even though theoretically there are many models that you can use that would suggest that there should be effects, uh, you know, that something should be happening uh, in this arrow uh, as well. Some models would say that it should go up. Should down, that's where we uh, where we end the year. So more clearly, this was a, a shock that was planned well before, 11 years before, in the Uruguay round. There was in place this multi-fiber arrangement, which was a system, complex system of uh, quotas, very discrimin uh, discriminatory, restricting imports uh, of clothing and, and textile items from all over the world. And as I mentioned, the most restricted country was by far China. So the question that we want to answer is, what's the impact of the policy change on exports from China to the rest of the world? So a little bit on the, you know, the, the background of this. So these quotas have a long history. It started in the 50s with quotas uh, imposed by the US, um, imports coming from, from Japan, then they evolved. Other countries started to use them as well. Other countries started to be affected at the same time. 74, the, world, the NFA was uh, was created. You know, basically, was uh, before that anyone could do. You know, anyone was doing whatever they wanted to do. 74 it was an attempt to put some order on this, but still not much. So it's basically kind of an umbrella where countries would discuss this and uh, the implementation of these quotas. Still, you know, very discriminatory in pretty much everybody. You know, any country could do whatever they wish to do. And there seem to be you know, some people have indicated that there is some strong path dependence in the sense that if a certain uh, good or you know had tough quotas on it from a certain country, this tended to uh, continue over time. 1995, you know, after the, the negotiations under the Uruguay Round. There was the ATC, an agreement on textiles and clothing. Uh, and the, the deal here was that these quotas would have to be phased out. This is 
was like kind of very sensitive sector in several countries. So this was 94, started in 95. This would end only 10 years later. So the idea is that you know, any kind of uh, adjustment cost would be smoothed out uh, over this period. So there were four phases you know, negotiated in 94. Fourth one was the one that we are focusing on here, which is the first day of 2005, where quotas and quotas representing basically half of the 1990 ports had to be lifted. And basically, the countries having these quotas, they had a choice of which products to liberalize in each phase. So, as you might imagine, the easy ones were liberalized in the first phases. The, really, the, the, the ones that really mattered, these were the ones left for. So, you know, this policy, in you know, a way, is obviously <coughs> anticipated. Although, I mean, if you, you know, if you talk with some people, you know, people in Geneva, kind of, the UNTAD, for example, and the WTO, you know, people who are um, involved in these negotiations, the general sense that this that I get from talking to them is that even right before the 2003 and 4, the general sense was that this would have happened, but they were not sure if exactly as planned because they were expecting that some company, the EU and the US in particular, would do something. But they did something. They introduced some extra safeguards, although those don't seem to be you know, like a, a very big deal relative to what uh, existed before. But there was some uncertainty about exactly what would happen. So China, uh, I mean, China is, uh, as I said, by far the most effective one. It's also interesting that China didn't participate in the negotiations in the first place simply because they were not in the WTO in doing the Uruguay round. So they came, came later when they entered the WTO. Three phases had been, should have been implemented already, so they had to implement all of them uh, at once in 2002. But again, the book of liberalization was left to uh, 2005. What do you mean by all? I mean, they, we are basically, I mean, as it happens, many of these products uh, that had quotas, or some of them, they had quotas, but these quotas were not really binding. You know, again, I think this is partially explained by past dependents. You know, this, some products had quotas before, but things have changed. You know, Japan, South Korea, which used to be like big exporters, started, you know, became importers. You know, many things changed. In over time, and some of these quotas simply were not binding. You know, even in actually in 2005, some of them were not binding. And in the first phases, those are the ones were lifted. But then, you know, it doesn't matter. So book, but I, by, by book I mean the book. You know, most of the industries where the quotas were binding. Yeah, uh, I mean, several papers have looked at you know, you know the explosion of exports from China to the affected countries, the EU and the US, after uh, the organization, which was something quite extraordinary. The literature, I mean, this, it's still relatively small, but it's growing, and I actually think that this is you know, fantastic, you know, one of the best, actually, uh, trade shots that people can use to analyze the effect of trade policy, because you know, it's large, really big, had been negotiated way before, 11 years before, uh, the, main, the, the main actor being affected didn't, didn't participate in the negotiation, which was China. So you know, many nice features, but you know, there is a growing literature. Let me look. Uh, these first two papers, you know, it's basically, they basically document all this explosion of exports from China to the affected countries. They advise kind of all shot in way make a nice, very nice point, you know, it's not just you know, restrict, 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 it was not just restriction of imports, it was also misallocation in the sense that the licenses in China were assigned mostly to state owned enterprises, firms that were not particularly productive. Therefore, the outcome that you see after liberalization is quite different from <coughs> what standard models would suggest because of this uh, additional inefficiency. Some, some papers, uh, I think there is more than just this, but this I think was the first, 
uh, also using this, uh, this trade shock as an instrument to look at other things. So in this case, it's like the effect of uh, imports on innovation, typical problem of, of the market, then they use the textiles and FA China uh, as, as an instrument. So you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very nice, quasi natural experience. Uh, but you know, in all of this, the focus has always been what happened, what happens in the U.S. relative to China, not the rest of the world, which is uh, how we do the There are a couple of you know, market effects. More generally, I mean, there is you know there is a there is a literature and we talked about just before on, on RTAs that kind of look at that in a way, but you know, the focus is quite different. These two papers that look specifically at this, uh, looking at anti-dumping safe, no, sorry, not the, these two papers here, anti-dumping safeguards, uh, which, you know, it's nice, they're nice, but I mean, the, the, the key issue there is the indigenous of the policies, which is something that, you know, you don't have to worry, at least you don't have to worry too much uh, in this setting. And there's also this paper, uh, Calafish, uh, the uh, who uh, have like a, a modified trade model looking at exports of uh, textiles from Bangladesh to the EU and the US, which is in a way quite you know, quite similar in spirit to what we do, but you know, basically what they do, uh, they do uh, it, it's more in structure. They do some simulations to see uh, some counterfactual experiments to see uh, the effects of change in rules of origin and other things. So in a way what we do, one way to interpret what we do is like the, you know, the reduced form estimation of their you know, the calibration of the data. So, uh, so, so you're selling the, the fact that the, the shock was actually negotiated that people knew about this is a good thing, but isn't that a problem that you let the countries adjust? too much and then uh, by the time you eventually do this, in terms of welfare, I mean, everybody has adjusted their, their production, their new trade partners, and then you're going to identify something that might be. I mean, two, two points on that. I mean, first of all, I mean, you, you can, you know, you can adjust, I mean, the way I, I started to preempt that question when I said that people were not completely sure of what exactly would happen, whether there will be some additional there being imposed by the main countries and they were to some extent. So they were, this, the shock was not fully at this stage. But you know, even if it was, I think, you know, it's still, I mean, it doesn't invalidate the problem because I mean, you can anticipate it. So, you know, right in China, you, know, you, you produce one of these products that is very restricted, you anticipate it, and then, but you know, it, it doesn't mean that you can start exporting until the, the quotas actually come down. Yeah, but, but the, their countries can adjust. So they know, for example, China is going to kick in, so they start to re reduce their production in the expectation or something. Yeah, they could no, So, you know, well, you know, whatever we capture here, we are capturing you know, the, the aggregate effect of you know, whatever reaction that might have been before uh, coming from this. I mean, it's, it's going to be a deep and deep thing. So, but there's a the thing in the different if you're going to be comparing a trend that might have been created by the negotiation, which is not the trend that you're expecting in, in a drastic policy implementation of country. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so the data set, I think, has been used by these two people in this room, maybe more. Uh, I think the same data, 2006, not like deal for us and said that we only have two years post, but Still, you know, we, we find kind of big numbers despite that. Uh, and we look at Chinese exports to basically all countries. We exclude Hong Kong and Macau because this has been, you know, some people, things to know, have been claimed that this counts basically served as a way to re export uh, from China to the EU and the US. And again, the, our, our focus is on the rest of the world. So we have two types of products here within uh, textiles and clothing. 
then I think restricted parts, and then we follow the literature here uh, and say that you are restricted if the fear rate is at least 90% in either the EU or the US in 2004. And then we have 27% of products uh, that are in this category. The other ones are not buying. So how, how many of those are hitting both? Because it's not clear what. Mm -hmm. If you're 50% in the EU and 90% in the US, it's not clear you're just going to it's a good question. I don't know the number. Okay. Okay. Actually, yeah, they have a lot of way of They do that, yes. They, they, exactly. do, they have about 230 products yeah. that are restricted, that are subject to quota in the US but not in the EU. Yeah. That's, what, that's what they used to identify. Right. Okay. Okay. So, and, and maybe it's about to come, but I know we have the picture, but can Exactly sure what I'm supposed to what, what we're about to test. For. What we are about to test is, you know, after this shock, you know, use you think about this, you know, from a typical different deep approach. What should happen with exports on different levels, you know, extensive margin, you know, extensive margin volumes, whatever, from China to counties where policy didn't change. Okay, and, and are we talking about countries that are some sense not textile and apparel exports? We or are we I, I don't know. Most of the time here what we do is we simply bundle them together, all of them. As you know, basically we think of two markets, the US, really Canada, and the rest of the world. We also do I don't know if it's actually which is the right way to do, but you know we also have regressions restricting this rest of the world to the developed economies that are clear importers uh, of which are basically not many, Japan, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. New countries that were developed but didn't have uh, any importers. <coughs> okay, so uh, it's the last talk, so uh, the illustration here. How, how different are these goods, the control and the other ones? So this is cotton slips, which were restricted in the US. Here are silk slips, which were unrestricted in the US. So, so in this, we can have these goods completely different. But they don't look completely different. No, some things are different. Yeah, it's not the same thing. But <laughs> flowers here, flowers in the picture, in the picture home. So they're a bit different. But I mean, uh, they, they are not completely different products. I think that's the and this comes, uh, I think that, that what the, what the literature argues that there was this you know, huge path dependence, and some, count, some goods became restricted and stayed restricted, others didn't, but then you know, nothing happened uh, with them. Of course, you know, this, kind of, this is simple, <coughs> it's called so different materials, you know, it, it's different. But the point here is that you know, I think they're comparable. So, before is before 2000, 2004, two years after. So we have a treatment is the what we call this NFA products, the ones that were uh, restricted, you know, had the quotas binding. And the other ones, the control group is the non-NFA products, where the products that didn't have quotas on them, or where the quotas were not binding in either the US or. You have two types of regressions, and maybe you should change that. That's what we have at the moment. So we have some that are more aggregate than the product level, which I think is, for me at least, it's refreshing in the sense that it gives us a kind of big picture of the aggregates involved. Then we cannot, of course, go to much more detail. And then we look at the first product level and see what happens and you know, try to come up with some mechanisms uh, uh, you know, and think, think more or deeply more about this. So first, the product level analysis. And here, you know, in the other one, we include the US as well, the regression. But here, let's just focus on, on the rest of the world. So what happens in the markets where policy didn't change uh, at all? So the typical regression here is some variable that we are interested in. We fix the effects for the product and for each year, and then we have the interaction between 
glorified uh, for value. So this is the percentage change in value from one year to another. We find a positive effect here for value as well as for quantity, for price. We don't see anything. And the number of firms is the one that is more precisely estimated. So you're increasing the number of firms, again, selling previously restricted products in the rest of the world after 2005 relative to the control group before. Just a feature that doesn't prove anything, but it gives a sense. Uh, so here what we have is average growth uh, of the number of firms per product. Uh, and you, the distinction is that non-NFA products, they're the ones not restricted. Here the ones restricted. So this is from China, so this is growth rate, so everything you know, is growing, so the only thing that changes is how much they're growing. What we observe here is that, and this again, is, this is all you know, exports going to the rest of the world. There's nothing happening here in the affected countries, in the directly affected countries. It suggests, it doesn't prove it, it suggests that there was a big difference before the shock, but not after the shock. Now, so we saw that the, the, the extensive marks seem to be like the, 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 it was the most precisely estimated. We can break that down. So here's the number of firms, the number of firms, you know, how much they change from one year to another. This is the number of entrants, the number of firms that failed, that were exported last year, but are not anymore. Uh, we can break that a bit more. So here we have like the entry rate. New number of new firms relative to the existing firms last period. And here we have the exit rate which is split by the new firms, the firms that just entered, you know, some firms that enter and exit right away. And this old is for old, so the old firms, so the exit rates, contribution of the old firms to exit. If we look, if we, if we run that on our the, the, the if variable, what we find is that entrance increase quite significantly, and that's basically what's driving this effect, so more entry. In terms of failure rate, don't see much. In terms of old firms exiting, nothing really changed. There is an effect here on the new firms, uh, you know, the contribution of the new firms for the exit rate increases after the shock, which is something that we should expect. We have more entry, so we have more, uh, this New firms are typically, we know that they fail more quickly than, than other firms, and that shows up here as well. Clearly, the key thing is seems to be more entry. So we could look at uh, the share. So here we look at the share of, of new firms in the total, the firms' uh, value and, and quantity, and these new firms contribute. In a, in a significantly different way, you know, in this deep and deep perspective, in terms of more firms, they contribute to with more value, more quantity relative to what happened before uh, the shock. If you look at the intensive margin, so here's basically averaging you know, over all firms uh, serving the rest of the world, and there isn't anything there. But that, I mean, in fact, when you look at the firm product uh, level, we see that there is actually heterogeneity there, and that's why I was trying to aggregate non effect. I mean, a few things that could be you know, playing a role in these results things like anticipation, as we already discussed, the first wave of liberalization, which happened in 2002, the safeguards that came later. So, what we do is we interact with the different variable with the done before 2004. The, one for the products where safeguards were imposed in 2005, because that you know, one possibility is that we see this increase in exports to the rest of the world simply because you know, the Chinese firms were all prepared for the big boom when it started. You know, they started to export like crazy to the to the EU and the US. The safeguards came, so they had all this this production, you know, production capacity. Uh, already, you know, uh, ready to, 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 to produce and ship goods. They can't ship to the U.S., so you know they pay tariff to the rest of the world. 
just go back when you before you ran these regressions, what what not these ones, the previous what is what coefficients did you expect? I, I would have just naively thought the intuition was well, you have better access to the US and Canada, um, that's a more preferred market, so to these other places you would be diverting towards them and away from rest of the world. So I would have expected the opposite. Yeah. I mean, now, putting any thought into it, yeah. what did you expect to? Well, I mean, actually, I don't know what to uh, expect. I mean, I, 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 have, I have asked the discussion with many people, and the priors are all over. People have, you know, and in fact, depending on the kind of model that you have in mind, you can think of different things. But, you know, we, we, we will discuss that. You just came to a diffuse prior. You didn't know what you were going to get. Yes. Yeah, I mean, but, Okay, yeah, I think the, the reason that actually I didn't yeah. have much of a price, so that's actually where we're trying to go, you know, you know tell a good story. But I think it's where the anticipation matters. I think if there's no, if you're not able to anticipate, you will expect that. But suppose you anticipate it, then you have to FB, FDI, or you move your production from one country that was exporting to China in the expectation, and then you become unimportant. Because because you anticipated. I mean, so just, just, I mean, uh, but, 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 I mean uh, our, our view now at least is that what is probably happening here, maybe we're wrong, but um, our uh, interpretation is some kind of hallmark effect or basically an increase in nature. So we have this big boom and now you know, becoming uh, a producer of clothing and textile products, of the previously restricted products. In China, it's much better. So the expected profits from you know getting a draw and becoming a firm in this industry is is much higher. So you have much more entry, and this will increase you know basically the overall productivity uh, of uh, of the industry in China as well as the number of firms in this in this product in China. And these firms will sell more to. I mean, there will be new firms producing those goods which could sell and did sell. The U.S. markets, but not necessarily you know, just to them. Yeah, I guess uh, <coughs> the FDI maybe has some FDI. Yes, and we said lots of Chinese firms, right. Chinese clothing firms, they before the 2005, they make investment right. in Africa. Right. Yeah, yeah. So right. in order to utilize them, that's right. all over there. So they stop producing, producing all over there. Just there. Right. I mean, the production there was essentially to sell, I mean, they could go around the borders, right. right? And to sell to the US markets. Right. Okay. Use that. Right. Yeah, so to the rest of the world, so, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't seem that it, this, this should affect much right. our store for the rest of the world, since the focus there, I mean, if anything, actually, you know, maybe it could go the other way around in the sense that these production facilities were there, they were selling, you know, they could go around the quotas, they could sell to the US even if they are not that good. Now they can and not everybody can, so they might actually divert their sales to the rest of the world, which would go kind of against what we find. So, so are you gonna think about uh, are you gonna look at the uh, anything about what we think those firms are doing with end products? We got all these new guys. So they should be able to quotas
observable differences <coughs> in measures of quality and price for entrance versus continuous versus guys who entered in the previous couple of years. But so they expect basically lower prices. Yeah, yeah they expect them to be the mass market guys. They, they, you know, they, they are not making those I mean, when, when we aggregate those results, so we don't have anything on price. Uh, we actually still don't have results on the firm product level for price. But okay. so, so that's an important thing. So you know, just quickly on this. Uh, so if you look at these other things, so anticipation, a good way of capturing anticipation uh, with the extra interaction, we actually don't see much happening. And you know, remember, this is the rest of the world. So we could have, so we, they could start exporting the rest of the world in 2004 or three or any time. There wasn't much uh, happening there. The, the first wave, you know, which was, uh, you know, Two and some products were liberalized, then we don't see anything there. In the safeguards, there, is, there seems to be something on price, but not much. I mean, in any case, the, you know, the key different diff result is kind of you know, it's exact, almost exactly the same, in particular, based on firms still there you know, as strong as before. Do you say that Maybe, you know, maybe uh, right, you know, there is something there for sure. I guess my main point here is simply in saying that these didn't change. The, you know, there, there was something here in mean, the this price effect with the safeguards. I mean, yeah, I'm not saying that nothing happened. So this is the thing that Andy asked about. I mean, here we only look at Japan, Australia, New Zealand. But it's a clear importance, and you know, if we put all of the other comes together, maybe you know, maybe the issue is too blurry to interpret anything. But if you do that, it's kind of the same, basically. It's um, pretty, pretty much uh, the same outcome, so it doesn't seem to make a big change. Uh, in the so, so, thinking out loud here, you know, what could be behind this? I mean, again, you can think about things going both directions. So, just thinking within firms. Typically, people think about asset constraints, financial constraints, or you know, some other kind of increasing returns to the scale. You know, if those are present, those are important. Obviously, we should have the opposite result. You know, one market, you know, this big market became you know, now available. So you know, I have my capacity constraints. You know, I'm going to sell to that market mostly because it's much more attractive. So I should reduce uh, how much I'm selling to the rest of the world. But you know, it doesn't really fit uh, the story, you know, maybe the opposite actually could fit the story, some kind of increasing returns we say, you know, we, that would fit into the anticipation, so let's innovate here, and create capacity to, you know, so that we can you know, be prepared when this big shock arrives. So, you know, in that case, we would find, you know, we'll have exactly the result of more exports to the rest of the world, although those would have to be with, you know, at the intensive part, so you should see uh, firms export, in, in particular, you should see firms that export to the US after the change also increasing, you know, those, mostly those firms increasing uh, exports to the rest of the world if they are, if it's to take advantage uh, of this. That, that's not true that it's a sunk cost of export. Okay, because so that, that, now that it, it changed, the sunk cost has changed, but if there is a sunk cost, right. the guys already paid it, they're not going to have any. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mix the things here. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I was thinking basically on yeah, reducing my shift cost. Yes. <coughs> you know, more generic labor effects, perhaps. I mean, the, what I had in mind was something like you know, more uh, standard neoclassical view. You know, suddenly, one market becomes more, much more attractive. Both markets are going to be served. You have some arbitrage conditions linked to prices. In both, and for, so we have prices, the price received for the Chinese exports in the US market going up, so the other one uh, would have to adjust, and this would only happen if you have less exports from China to the rest of the world to compensate this. Although, obviously, this, I mean, this wouldn't give you anything on the intensive and extensive parts. It doesn't seem to go in the right direction, or does seem to go in the right direction. Is something you know, that goes 
together with free entry, you know, using free entry conditions. So now the, you know, the benefit from starting a firm in those uh, products, produce those products, increases. So now more firms and these firms are in general uh, as well. So, so firm, firm product level analysis. So just the, the last sentence, that they're better. That's only true if, if the quota, the guys who have quota, are randomly allocated the quota or perversely allocated the quota, right? Because if the best guys get the, bid, get, the, get the quota, then it's the next group that should get it. Right? So you made the statement, which is probably true, that the quotas were allocated based on function. Right? So, it's, so let's call it random across the productivity distribution. But, because this random, is, then, but this is thinking about the EUS markets. I mean, in that case, that's true. But if you're thinking about what these firms could do with the rest of the world, and they were free to do anything before and after, then so this increasing entry would increase the overall productivity in the, in the industry. And the ones that start to export now, that decide to export, they would be on average better. That was the opposite of what you said earlier. Right? Yeah, I, I, I would say that because the, the <coughs> entry was good. Was more likely to be in before. Now, the this effect, you know, it's got a cutoff effect, so it lowers the cost of kind of lowers the productivity cutoff. So the work on average, the worst guys getting in, it doesn't make the big guys. So it more like off. Yeah. And, and I understand the mass metrics, but that's just going to replicate the existing distribution. It's not going to shift. It's not like new new firms are drawn from a better distribution than old firms. But the firms that will survive. The market in the Chinese market, they will be on average better. The, 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 the distribution of firms will be better. The surviving exporters will be worse because the export cut off. To, to the US? No, not to the rest of the world. If, the, if, if, this, if there's some cost that depends on the total export, we would have to do it. If there's market specific costs that, that you have to pay individually, that you would have to pay individually. That's what I yeah, well, but, the, but this, your results are suggesting that there's a common sub cost <coughs> that you, you have to pay to get in, right? And that the country specific costs are all. <coughs> could be, could be that. Yeah. Okay, so here, so we look at it's margin entry and exit uh, at a firm product level. So the typical regression. Do you have ownership structure or something like that? Uh, we do, I mean, uh, we do, I mean, whether the firm is uh, state-owned or private, <coughs> or, or yeah. if the is changing, or if the well, is changing. Well, I'm not market. sure if we have FDI. Yeah. Maybe we do, but it's not something that uh, actually, you know, I don't think we do, I don't remember you know talking about this. I think, yeah, yeah, I think you know the Chinese Sorry? I think you know the Chinese data. I think it's there. Yeah? Okay. Maybe we do. So I'm thinking of that but what, we, what we know is that if the firm is state owned, if it's private, whether it's private, whether, whether it's foreign, I mean, that, that we know. More than that, I don't know. So, so, so here also include basically for comparison reasons what happens in the US market. Everything is the level of the firm product destination. And here, I think here we have fixed effects for the firm out of care as well as for you know, the destinations and destination destination here. Yes. Yeah. I have six here. <laughs> and we also I think go in the direction that you suggested. We have some, you know, we do some interactions. The connected, it's not exactly connected, but we call it connected in the sense that these are firms that sold NFA products in the US markets before 2005. So somehow they found a way to do it. These are firms that didn't do that, but entered the US market after the liberalization. And these are firms that did not enter the US markets ever. Uh, let's see. It's a bit, a bit too small, but so for the US, what we, so for the intensive market, so here we have intensive margin firm, like continuous exporters, the firms that export throughout the whole period, and the, the, the firm, uh, 
the firm product pair that wear there uh, throughout that whole period. So it's a bit restrictive. In fact, if you look at that, even for the US, you don't really find uh, much. You do find something when you distinguish between state-owned enterprises and private firms, which is, goes exactly along, you know, in the direction of the candle out shot and way paper. So for state-owned enterprise, you don't have anything for the private ones actually have a they wasn't managed to be there before, they have an important effect. Now, for the rest of the world, which is our focus here, we don't see anything in the intensive margin. When you break, you know, by, uh, if you look at you know, the Japan, Australia, New Zealand, also nothing. And here, if we do this and try to see some different types of firms, we don't see anything. That could be, and in fact it is, because we've been too restrictive here in the sense of looking only at the firm, firm product pairs that are there you know, throughout uh, the whole period. If we are more, if we allow for you know, any other, you know, basically all firms, the only in order to identify here, we only need firm product pairs in the destination before and after uh, the change, then the results get uh, stronger. You know, for the US, it's kind of the same. And now we have a, a result here, but everything is driven by private companies. <coughs> If we look at the rest of the world, the net effect uh, isn't there, but you actually observe an effect if you also enter the, the US market later. So the first, so some kind of increasing return to scale of some sort uh, seems to be operating there. And on the other hand, the ones that the connected ones, the ones that managed to get into the US market before, but probably you know, on average they weren't they were that good they actually lower, so the game goes in the direction of some kind of increased return to scale. So, you know, you'll, you'll basically, you lose the value of your connection in the US, then you lose in the rest of the world as well. Now, for extensive margin, so we do the kind of same thing. Now, you know, we look at this non available entry, which is one, if the firm sells, uh, there's, if there's this product, product uh, firm, uh, there sells in the in period T, but not in the previous period. And here you have fixed effects for the power destination and here uh, destination. And then we do also the interaction with, with the types of firms and add fixed effects for them as well. But what we find is that for the US, as you would expect, you know, there's more entry, clearly. And if you distinguish between state-owned enterprise and the rest, the effect is bigger for the rest and the private firms. If we look at the rest of the world, the net effect is clearly positive, and exactly as we found in the aggregate uh, regressions. And moreover, when we distinguish by type, we find kind of the same signal pattern again. But the firms that actually enter the US, they, they, the effect is especially big. So these are firms that all of you know, there is a big shock, they enter both uh, at the same time. So the new new firm is going everywhere. The connected ones, they actually decrease entry, so they, this firm are really hit. But we also find an effect for you know, more entry, even for firms that did not enter the US markets, which is you know, we, you know so here clearly some kind of increasing return to scale story within the firm couldn't be playing a role because the firm is not taking advantage uh, explicitly of this extra market. But this, the, the result is still there. So for exit, the story here is basically the same as before, the same as entry, except that the numbers are much lower. So you know, in a way, it's what we would, would expect. Yeah, I'll, I'll skip this, uh, just, just conclude. This is kind of a First, you know, think of try to get something on the you know, within firm relocation problems, which I think is something that we should explore more, but we don't have much yet. So the setting here, kind of quasi natural trade policy experience, probably as good as it gets for trade policy. We stood the colony of quotas in the EU and the US will affect exports from China to the rest of the world. Clearly, many models would have implications for that, but Empirically, this is quite difficult to evaluate, you know, especially with an identification which is relatively clean as, as the one that we have. We 
find a significant increase in Chinese exports to the rest of the world for identical products after the end of the quotas in this definitive perspective. Largely, this was due to an extensive margin, although the intensive margin we, when we allow for actually an eye between a firm product, we actually you know, we find something as well. Basically, this is reflecting more entry, not less yeah, exit. And the extensive margin results uh, are present even for firms that don't have any involvement in the US markets after uh, the change. So the results seem to be consistent with the end of expected profits uh, driving location decisions, so more, uh, more firms try to enter into this industry. It's something that you know, we have models for that, but it's quite difficult to pin down these effects empirically because these are typically thoughts of long run things. What's nice here, allows us to, I don't know if you're identifying this, but suggest that this, this force might be there. The policy change is pretty <coughs> large. It was it's partially anticipated, so firms reacted, you know, acted, the relevant actors reacted before. The setup costs, relatively speaking, are you know, quite low. And this is also a country that you know, basically has been producing these types of products forever, so you kind of know how to do it and how to set up new uh, new operations pretty quickly, so that's probably how we are able to observe that.